Lord, what remarkable words to reflect on, to have assurance that steals us for life, for trials, even persecution, for fire. Lord, what a great confidence we have in you, in your finished work, that we could brook no confidence in our own abilities, our own faith or faithfulness, or even um, our own desire to cling to you. We would place all of our confidence in your secure grip. And we thank you for your love, which defies our unloveliness. We thank you for your kindness, which overwhelms our sin. We thank you for your son who bled in our place. As we open your word tonight, we pray that you would be honored, that we would be encouraged, given courage for this coming week. We ask it in your name. Amen. You may be seated. Welcome back to the book of Daniel and Daniel 3. It was two weeks ago that we saw the miracle on the plane. P-L-A-I-N, not airplane. And the miracle on the plane was the work of God wrought in the hearts of three young men who with calmness and assurance of truth defied a king. And they defied a king at the risk of their own lives. And you remember the story, Nebuchadnezzar had set up a statue, demanded that all worship it, and three young men said they would not. Their resolute confidence in God is striking. It was a stark contrast to everything around them. It went against the grain. They were fish swimming upstream. They were not squeezed into the mold of the world. They were countercultural. We're thankful for the chain of encouragements that had come from Daniel. Perhaps Daniel had been encouraged by those before him, young King Hezekiah who found the word of God in the temple and restored Yahweh worship in Israel. And then the three young men encouraged by Daniel's example in not eating the king's food and not being polluted by the idolatry that it would have involved. And now these three young men left to themselves before the king, before the pomp and circumstance, before the orchestra, before the crowds, before the great golden statue stood really is a remarkable miracle that has already taken place. We're looking at the second installment of that miracle this evening. What happens? <laughs> it was something of a cliffhanger where we left off. Verse 17, if, O Nebuchadnezzar, this be so, if you really will throw us into the fire, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the furnace of blazing fire, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, Let it be known to you, O king, that we are not going to serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Really remarkable statement. Their faith was bigger than self-preservation. They were eager to honor God, to honor the first commandment, to love the Lord their God with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength, to have no graven images, to make no likeness, and to worship no other. And these young men were strengthened in their faith to do just that. We'll see in the rest of the chapter this evening God's miracle on behalf of these three young exiles unfolding in three events. And we'll start, first of all, with the execution of the sentence. Read with me, beginning in verse 19. Then Nebuchadnezzar was filled with wrath, and his facial expression was altered towards Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He answered by giving orders to heat the furnace seven times more than it was usually heated. He commanded certain valiant warriors who were in his army to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in order to cast them into the furnace of blazing fire. Then these men were tied up in their trousers, their coats, their caps, and their other clothes, and they were cast into the midst of the furnace of blazing fire. For this reason, because the king's command was urgent and the furnace had been made extremely hot, the flame of the fire slew those men who carried up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell into the midst of the furnace of blazing fire tied up. Nebuchadnezzar meant what he said. He couldn't let this defiance of the king go unpunished. 
Uh, he would only endorse further defiance, and so he had to follow through on his word, especially with everybody watching. You can imagine the scene. The music has stopped. Nebuchadnezzar is making his demands, and three slave youths are defying the king. And you have to imagine the murmurings through the crowd. Uh, who would be so crazy as to just go through the motions, guys? But you know, the Chaldeans that had set them up for this very thing, ratted them out, as it were. They were envious of their position, jealous of the power that they held. They themselves had been passed over for positions by these three upstart Jewish slaves. They were eager to see them roast. In verse 19, we see Nebuchadnezzar's anger. Literally, the image was changed of his face. And the word image in the Aramaic text is remarkable because we've seen image show up before. It was the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up, and now it is the image of his face that is altered. He no longer looks on Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego with favor. He no longer sees them as really good academicians who went through the program, who used all of his investment wisely and are now serving the empire well. Whatever favors they had earned by their work ethic were lost in a moment. And Nebuchadnezzar here is wearing his emotions on his face. His face is altered, twisted in anger. You may know people that wear their emotions on their sleeve. And Nebuchadnezzar's face was so radically changed towards Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego as to be unrecognizable. He was full of blind rage, and his command is absurd. Look at verse 19. He answered by giving orders. Um, he, they've said they're only going to worship God. Nebuchadnezzar's answer was, turn it up seven times. This furnace goes to seven. Uh, I don't think this is an exact measurement. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar is uh, giving just an absurd request and throws the lever to make this thing the hottest it can go. This is just blind rage. It is irrational at this point. He is angry and makes an absurd demand. He has been defied and he will not have it. There are some pictures drawn of this kind of furnace from ancient Babylon. Uh, there are some uh, relief uh, pictures on walls that tell us what this looked like. It was something like a large, old-fashioned milk bottle, a narrow top and a large bottom. And it was usually built against a hill so that could, people could walk up a slanted slope and put things in at the top. They could insert ore at the top or victims. And the bottom was open. It had a door uh, often covered with a gate that you could put fuel in, coal for fire to burn this thing. And then oftentimes there were holes in the sides of it that were connected with long pipes. And at the long end of those pipes, far away from the furnace, were bellows. If you remember bellows, old-fashioned fireplace blowers, you would squeeze them like this and they would push air to the fire and they would make the fire extremely hot. Apparently here, everything is turned up. Get this fire going extremely hot. It would have been a waste of fuel. It would have been terribly inefficient, but it would have vented Nebuchadnezzar's rage. In verse 20, we see that Nebuchadnezzar commanded certain valiant warriors who were in his army, certain strong ones of his strength. These are the mighty men of Nebuchadnezzar's army. These are probably something like his special forces. These are the meatheads. They're going to lock arms with Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego and escort them up the slope to the top of this furnace and make sure they get in. There will be no escape attempts. There will be no shenanigans. Nebuchadnezzar in verse 15 of chapter 3 already said, and what God is there that can deliver you out of my hand? These strong men are his hand enforcing Nebuchadnezzar's order of execution. Verse 21, we see these men, that is Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego, were tied up in their trousers, their coats, their caps, and their other clothes and they were cast in the midst of the furnace of blazing fire. Uh, these four words for articles of clothing are something of a mystery to us. We, we don't really have a good lead on what these individual articles were, and so all of your English translations are a little bit different. They're kind of guesses. The one word we think matches actually is probably the word caps, which was probably something like a turban. 
all the other stuff, clothes and other kinds of clothes, and there are other kinds of clothes, and they had turbans. That's basically the idea here. Why are their clothes mentioned? I think uh, the, the reason they were thrown in with their clothes, which was contrary to custom, uh, we understand that the Babylonians typically stripped their victim, victims and threw them in. Uh, but here they are fully clothed. This indicates that Nebuchadnezzar was so furious that this command was urgent. Uh, that is, they, they didn't want to take the time to do anything but immediate summary execution. But what's interesting about wearing their clothes is in God's providence, it's a setup to demonstrate the miracle that is about to take place, the undeniable miracle that is about to take place. All of the clothing that they would have been thrown in with would have been highly flammable. Uh, The loose clothing of the ancient Near East uh, would have gone up in flames very quickly. There was to be no mistaking about what was about to happen here. Look at verse 22, for this reason, because the king's command was urgent, and because the furnace had been made extremely hot, the flame of the fire slew the men who carried up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So the strong men, the mighty men, the navy seals that have got them arm in arm and have walked up the slope, escorting them pace by pace right up to the lip of the top of this furnace as they're tossing them in, tied up, bound up in their clothes, these men are slain by the flames of the fire. How hot is this fire? The, 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 the flames aren't supposed to be cooking the top of the thing. Uh, that, that would have uh, destroyed what was to be refined in a lime kiln or a brick kiln. It would have exceeded the temperatures needed to smelt ore. And so these men, you can imagine... If your job was to be the mighty man of a tyrant, um, you weren't a milk toast kind of guy. You were probably rough and tumble, a little rough around the edges. You were used to executions. I imagine these guys probably prided themselves in their occupation, probably a little pleasure in throwing these rebels in, we'll show you. And what happens at the top of the furnace? The fire is so hot as they are tossing in God's slaves. They themselves are instantly sizzled. It's it's game over for them. What What a horrible scene. They were holding on to the victims to be and they became the victims. In the next verse, verse 23, the three fall in, tied up. Were they dropped when the strong men were killed? slain by the fire? Is it kind of one motion, the men are throwing them in, and as they're too close to the lip, they they get scorched? But the three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, verse 23, fell into the midst of the furnace of fire, still tied up. That leads to the second event in this miracle, the deliverance of the slaves, beginning in verse 24. Read with me. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king was astounded and stood up in haste. He said to his high officials, his counselors, Was it not three men we cast bound into the midst of the fire? They replied to the king, Certainly, O king. He said, Look, I see four men loosed and walking about in the midst of the fire without harm, and the appearance of the fourth is like a son of God's. Then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the door of the furnace of blazing fire. He responded and said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, come out, you servants of the Most High God, and come here. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the midst of the fire. The satraps, the prefects, the governors, the king's high officials gathered around and saw in regard to these men that the fire had no effect on the bodies of these men. Nor was the hair of their heads singed, nor were their trousers damaged, nor had the smell of fire even come upon them. This is a remarkable miracle. In verse 24, we see that Nebuchadnezzar can see what's going on in the furnace. He has stationed himself as a spectator to watch these three men be thrown in. He watches them fall. He sees his mighty men slain by the fire. He watches them fall in tied up. What a macabre scene. What what an awful reality that the, the emperor is there to watch his victim sizzle because he didn't get his way. 
Of course, nothing goes according to his plan here. He is astounded and stood up in haste. Literally, in being alarmed inside himself, he was startled and he stood up. There is fear here and hurrying. Imagine the hysterics in Nebuchadnezzar. Maybe his voice is raised as he's calling out to his counselors. What's going on in Nebuchadnezzar's mind? Uh Uh-oh, I am in trouble. He doesn't see his victims down there at the bottom the way that he thought he would see them. And so he asks a question that was obvious to everyone. Didn't we toss three? True, O king. Three men went into the furnace. In verse 25, as Nebuchadnezzar looked in, nothing was as he expected. Look, he says, I see four men loosed, walking about in the midst of the fire without harm, and the appearance of the fourth is like a son of God's. When Nebuchadnezzar gazed in at the furnace from his spectator spot, he realized he was clearly not in control. What he expected to see, he did not see. Four men, not three. Loosed, not bound. Were their cords burned off? Or did someone help the three and remove the cords? And they were walking around, not wallowing in freakish misery on the floor of the furnace, not running for the exit. And they are unharmed, not roasted. 150 years prior to this event, Isaiah prophesied in Isaiah 43, 2, when you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. It's a remarkable statement that finds a really interesting parallel here. And notice what Nebuchadnezzar sees, a fourth. And the appearance of the fourth is like a son of the gods. Uh, There's two ways to read this phrase. You, You could read it as like a son of God, capital G, or like a son of gods, lowercase g and plural. Uh, The Aramaic, like the Hebrew, has a plural here for God, but most of the times in Hebrew, Elohim, which is plural, im is the plural ending in Hebrew, doesn't mean multiple gods, it's a reference to the one true God. It is the way the Hebrew Old Testament speaks of him. And it's likely the Aramaic has the same feature here, although the one true God is not spoken of in this way very much in the Aramaic literature from this time period. It's really most likely that Nebuchadnezzar sees what he sees, identifies it from his polytheistic worldview, and says, that one that I see looks like a son of God's. And in the Babylonian pantheon, there were gods who uh, had sons who were also gods and other sons who were also gods. It's kind of like the Greek mythology and the Norse Norse mythology in that way. And so he is reflecting based on what he knows, what he thinks. He's a polytheistic Babylonian. But for him, that would mean that whatever is walking around in the furnace is deity, It is divine in nature. Down in verse 28, he talks about the angel of God. And in Babylonian mythology, that would also be a reference to supernatural, even divine beings. For Nebuchadnezzar here to say, this one is a son of deity, means this is a divine being. Who is this fourth? Well, the words of Nebuchadnezzar may not mean much, For Nebuchadnezzar to call him the angel of God um, may not have the same reference we think of when we think of the angel of God or the angel of Yahweh, the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament. But if this is a theophany, if this is a theophany, that is an appearance of God, a personal manifestation, a visible appearing of God, um, then it's very likely that we are dealing with the angel of Yahweh here. I do take the view that Old Testament theophanies are, in fact, Christophanies. That is, the appearance of the second person of the Trinity pre-Bethlehem. Before the second person of the Trinity took on flesh at Bethlehem and was the baby Jesus, he showed up on the earth numbers of times. I'll give you just one example where you can see this, not related to the angel of the Lord. 
But turn to Isaiah chapter 6. In Isaiah 6, we have this memorable scene. Isaiah is whisked into a vision in the temple of God. And he says, In the year of King Uzziah's death, I saw the Lord, that's Edonai, meaning Lord or Master, sitting on a throne, lofty and exalted, and the hem of his robe was filling the temple. Seraphim stood above him, each having six wings. With two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, with two he flew. One called out to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is Yahweh of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the thresholds trembled at the voice of him who called out while the temple was filling with smoke. And the scene is remarkable. God is manifesting his presence here in such a grand and glorious way that the temple is filled with smoke and the last stitch of the edge of his robe is filling the temple. And in this holy place, holy beings who have never sinned, the fiery ones, the seraphim, they are hovering above holy ground, not touching the ground. They're covering their feet with their wings. They're covering their faces with their wings. And they're hovering with a set of wings. And these holy ones are crying out, holy, holy, holy is Yahweh. These are sinless beings crying out that God himself in his manifest presence is so utterly different than we are. And their voices shake the temple. That's not God's voice shaking the temple. These are the seraphim voices shaking the temple as they cry out in worship. Isaiah is floored. He calls down curses upon himself in verse 5. Woe is me, I am ruined. I'm a man of unclean lips and live among a people of unclean lips. Notice what he says. My eyes have seen the king, Yahweh of hosts, Yahweh of armies. What's fascinating about this scene is it is referred to in the New Testament in the Gospel of John. And you can look at this, John chapter 12 and verse 41. Jesus is explaining the unbelief of God's people Israel in his day. And he makes reference to Isaiah 6 and the commissioning of Isaiah. If we were to go on in Isaiah 6, we'd hear Isaiah's commissioning, here am I, send me. And I'm going to send you, God says, to a people who won't listen, stubborn of heart, stopped up of ears. And Jesus, commenting on this, says in verse 41, these things Isaiah said because he saw his glory and he spoke of him. This is John telling us in John 12 that what it was seen in Isaiah 6 was none other than the Lord Jesus Christ, pre-incarnate, before Bethlehem. The role of the second person of the Trinity, according to Colossians 1, is to be the image of of the invisible God. This is the role of the second person in the Trinity. He is the Word of God, the exact representation of His nature. I believe when you see God in the Old Testament, you have seen the second person of the Trinity. When you come to the identity of the angel of the Lord, the angel of Yahweh, I believe we are seeing there the second person of the Trinity, the pre-incarnate Christ. In Genesis 16 and 18 and 22, the angel of Yahweh is identified as God. In Joshua 5 and Judges 2, the angel of Yahweh is worshipped as God. And in Genesis 31 and in Exodus 3, the angel of Yahweh calls himself God. And so when you find this description, the angel of God, the angel of Yahweh, with the definite article, the you are dealing with the appearance of a divine being. You're dealing with the appearance of God himself. I would encourage you to listen again to John Anderson's introduction to Mark. He works through the identification of the pre-incarnate Christ as the angel of Yahweh who ensured the safety of his people's exodus from Egypt and safe entrance into the promised land in order to bring about the fulfillment of God's covenant promises to his people. And so when Nebuchadnezzar makes reference in verse 28 to 
the God of, or the angel of God. And when he says in verse 25 that this fourth walking around in the fire is like a son of God or a son of God's, it seems that he is observing firsthand the pre incarnate Christ. I'm not sure that could be absolutely proven from this text, but whether God has sent an angel to rescue his servants, or whether God himself has shown up in the furnace to rescue his servants, it is clear that the answer to Nebuchadnezzar's question, what God is there who could deliver you out of my hands, has been answered. (laughs) And this would shake Nebuchadnezzar to the core. Look what he says in verse 26. (laughs) Nebuchadnezzar came near to the door of the furnace of blazing fire. Don't get too close. Did you see what happened to your mighty men? And he said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, calls him by name, come out, you servants of the Most High God, slaves of God Most High, and come here. Is he making appeasement? (laughs) to whatever force, whatever factor just delivered these slaves out of his hand and out of his power. He's got to tip his hat to whatever power is going on here. Come out, guys, come out. And then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the midst of the fire. You're waiting for the fourth. Why doesn't the fourth come out? Just the three. And look who's there to see it. Verse 27. Eyewitnesses to the miracle. Make no mistake about this miracle. The audience of his top officials could not deny this. And this is really remarkable. Fire had no power on their bodies. The hair of their heads was not singed. Their clothes were not harmed. Literally, their clothes weren't changed. They weren't altered in any way. And then finally, there was not even smell of smoke on them. I kind of like pulling out old clothes that have been at the beach with a campfire. Ah, That smell of smoke just gets in there and it stays. Not a smell of smoke on their clothing. This is an undeniable miracle. With the corpses of the mighty men fried next to the top entrance of the furnace, these three men walked out of the center of it totally unscathed, totally unharmed, untouched by the fire. I think it's ironic in verse 26 when Nebuchadnezzar calls him by name. Do you remember Abednego's name? Uh, Azariah, Mishael, uh, Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah. Yeah, but his Babylonian name, Abednego, uh, instead of slave of Yahweh means slave of Nebo. And here Nebuchadnezzar has to call him out by name. Slave of Nebo, uh, slave of the Most High God. (laughs) And it's just ironic to see those back to back. You renamed him as a slave of one of your pagan deities that is no God at all, and now you have to admit openly in front of all of your officials that he truly is a slave of God Most High. What a a remarkable pickle he is in. This leads to his confession, beginning in verse 28. This is the king's confession, the third event in this miracle. Nebuchadnezzar responded and said, Blessed be God, this sounds like Ephesians, blessed be God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants who put their trust in him, violating the king's command, yielding up their bodies so as not to serve or worship any god except their own. Therefore, I make a decree that any people, nation, and tongue that speaks anything offensive against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be torn limb from limb and their houses reduced to a rubbish heap inasmuch as there is no other God who is able to deliver in this way. Then the king caused Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to prosper in the province of Babylon. Here we have the answer to Nebuchadnezzar's Question in verse 15, what God is there who can deliver you out of my hand? Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Listen to Deuteronomy 32, 39. See now that I, I am he. There is no God besides me. It is I who put to death. It is I who give life. I have wounded and it is I who heal and there is no one who can deliver from my hand, says Yahweh. 
Nebuchadnezzar dared to defy Yahweh with power over life and death. Three slaves of Yahweh dared to defy Nebuchadnezzar. And God showed him up. The first miracle, the miracle in the heart that God had wrought in steadfast faith in the three servants is on display in this list in verse 28. The God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, he sent his angel and delivered his servants. And then you get this description of what the servants did. His servants put their trust in him. They violated the king's command. They yielded up their bodies. And the New American Standard says they yielded up their bodies so as not to serve or worship. Um, in, the, in the Aramaic here, you have past tense verb, past tense verb, past tense verb, all completed actions. And then you have these incomplete actions that ought to be translated as futures. They put their trust in him, they violated the king's command, they yielded up their bodies, and they will not serve, and they will not worship any god except their god. It's a remarkable statement. It is clear at this point to Nebuchadnezzar that nothing could be done to compel these servants of the Most High God to disobey him in favor of obeying some puny earthly power like Nebuchadnezzar. They were already willing to go to the death for obedience. What more could a guy like Nebuchadnezzar do? He had no more leverage. He couldn't take anything away from him. It's like the early Christian martyr who was asked by a Roman emperor, well, what if I uh, take away all your stuff? I don't have anything here. What if I take away your home? My citizenship's in heaven. What if I take away your life? My life is hid with Christ. <laughs> you got nothing on me. Nebuchadnezzar had nothing on these. They defied the king. They defied his order because they will not serve, they will not worship any god except the one true God. Verse 28 clarifies for us that bowing to Nebuchadnezzar's image would indeed have been a matter of worship. Nebuchadnezzar says as much here. By the way, where is that image now? I don't mean today, but... As everybody's eyes are focused when the three walk out of the furnace, nobody's looking at the image anymore. The music has stopped. It's not going to start up. I mean, what is that 90-foot pile of gold doing out there in the plain all lonely while all the officials, all the crowds, and the king's attention are all on these three young men who just walked out of the furnace? God is at center stage here. This second miracle on the plain is God sent his angel to rescue his three servants. Verse 29, we see Nebuchadnezzar's decree. Therefore, he's, he's still the tyrant. <laughs> he's still in charge. He's got to save some face. He's got to recover his authority here. Of course, he has to recover his authority in a way that doesn't offend this God that just rescued the slaves. But he's still making decrees. Therefore, I make a decree that any people, nation or tongue, I mean, he's just got this grandiose, universal authority in his mind. Any people, nation or tongue that speaks anything offensive against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be literally, uh, he shall be limbed for himself. Uh, he shall be delimbed, uh, his arms and legs torn off. And their houses will be reduced to a dunghill, a rubbish heap. And then notice what he says. Inasmuch as there is no other God who is able to deliver in this way. He has to acknowledge. He is forced here to confess what is undeniable. The God of Israel could deliver the servants out of his hand. And here, Nebuchadnezzar simply makes the worship of Israel's God legal. He doesn't make it the official religion of the land. Notice, he didn't stop where he should have stopped. I mean, verse 29 should read this way, inasmuch as there is no other God, period. That's what Nebuchadnezzar should have said. But he said, there's no other God who's able to deliver in this way. I mean, there are lots of other gods. And so we'll put the God of Israel on the knick-knack shelf with all the other pantheon of gods. We'll give him his due. We'll honor him. We're not going to offend him, so nobody say anything offensive about him. 
We're not going to speak ill of him. He here has just enjoined universal toleration of the worship of Yahweh. He has not compelled everybody to worship him as the only God. This is not repentance, even though uh, verse 28 starts out like a benediction and a doxology. Nebuchadnezzar here is not a believer. Notice verse 30, Then the king caused Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to prosper in the province of Babylon. They already had top positions. Now Nebuchadnezzar is giving his full stamp of authority that there will be no more snitches, no more conspiracies, no more overturning of their prosperity and their authority in the province. Nebuchadnezzar is not going to anger their God any further. What a mercy this scene is to a tyrant king, polytheist, Babylonian, that, that God Himself would show up, either in person, in the second person in the Trinity in the furnace, or by sending an angel to rescue, the unmistakable that Yahweh, the God of Israel, is in charge over life and death, and that Yahweh has intervened on behalf of His servants, that Yahweh has made Nebuchadnezzar eat His words. What a grace. Nebuchadnezzar could find out he was on the wrong side of history when history is over. And instead, while he's still breathing, God shows up. What a kindness to us when God shows up when we're at our worst, while we're still alive. Not every faithful follower walks out of the fiery furnace. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did. At some point they died, we don't have the record of that. Um, they didn't keep getting delivered from stuff. <laughs> a couple of years ago, Janet and I uh, stood on a spot in Newgate in London where several English Reformation martyrs were burned. Not by Nebuchadnezzar, not in a milk bottle shaped furnace, but by Queen Mary, Bloody Mary, who between 1555 and 1558 oversaw the burning of some 288 men, women, and children. Most of them men, most of them pastors, but some women and children as well. Their crime, translating the Bible into English, denying the Catholic Mass. To, to simply say, and you've heard Omri talk through this issue in a quipping hour and even in a, a Lord's Table meditation recently, but to simply say that Jesus doesn't have to be re-crucified every time church happens in order to pay for sin because the cross wasn't enough. Uh, to, to deny transubstantiation, that when the priest hovers over the elements of communion, he actually turns them into the actual body and the actual blood of Christ, which have to be re-sacrificed again and again and again to pay for sins. To deny that Catholic doctrine in Mary's day was a death sentence. And do you understand why the English Reformation martyrs had to deny that doctrine? Because the gospel is at stake. The gospel is at stake in that very thing. Jesus died and said, it is finished. He was a sacrifice once for all, once for all time, to bring us to God. This was a critical issue. These, these men, although they uh, died over what was a, a theological term with a bunch of nuance, it was life and death theologically, and it meant for them standing as Daniel's three friends stood in Babylon so many years ago. Many people have taken courage from these three young men, even as these three young men took courage from Daniel, even as Daniel perhaps took courage from Hezekiah. And we stood on this spot where John Rogers, John Philpot, and Jan John Bradford were all burned. John Rogers burned February 4th, 1555. He was the first under Bloody Mary. He was a translator of English Bibles. Uh, his was the Matthews Bible. He was working with Tyndale and Coverdale, and um, he didn't put his own name on it because he knew his, his life was in danger. It was said that Rogers went to his death as if he was walking to his wedding. French officials who were present who saw him couldn't believe the sight. John Philpot was burned at the stake December 18, 1555. He was the eighth leading reformer to be burned by Mary. 
There are 140 pages recorded of the examinations that were designed to turn John Philpot away from his convictions. He refused to turn. They put all the pressure on that they could. The night before his execution, he received a note that he was to be burned the next day. He said, I am ready. God grant me strength and a joyful resurrection. At the stake where he is burned, he kissed it. He said, shall I disdain to suffer at this stake, seeing my Redeemer did not refuse to suffer a most vile death on the cross for me? John Bradford was killed July 1st, 1555. John Bradford is heroic in a number of ways. Uh, He's the pastor who was so overwhelmed at God's mercy and grace in his life that when he noticed a, a drunkard or a thief on the side of the road, his... Uh, impulse was to pray for them, have mercy upon them, and say, but for the grace of God, there goes John Bradford. (laughs) He just had an overwhelming view of, of his own sin that humbled him. He was a pastor only five years, two of which were spent in prison before he was burned. To a young man being burned with him, he said, be of good comfort, brother, for we shall have a merry supper with the Lord this night. In a farewell letter to his church friends, he wrote, The condemnation is not a condemnation of Bradford simply, but rather a condemnation of Christ and His truth. Bradford is nothing else but an instrument in whom Christ and His doctrine are condemned. Therefore, my my dearly beloved, rejoice, rejoice, and give thanks with me and for me that ever God did vouchsafe so great a benefit to our country as to choose the most unworthy, I mean myself, to be one in whom it would please him to suffer any kind of affliction, much more this violent kind of death, which I perceive is prepared for me with you for his sake. All glory and praise be given unto God our Father for this exceeding great mercy towards me through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. John Bradford had written four years earlier in 1551, Remember, Christ lost more for you than you can lose for him. Remember, you lose not that which is lost for his sake, for you shall find much more here and elsewhere. Remember, you shall die, and when and where and how, you cannot tell. Remember, the death of sinners is most terrible. Remember, the death of God's saints is precious in his sight. How many have been encouraged, emboldened by the Marian martyrs? to stand courageously in the face of their own deaths. Would we face the fire? Love our Lord more than life itself. A good measure for that is the small things we face in life now. How do we face little compromises? How do we face the loss of reputation, the loss of friendships, the loss of income? Whatever it costs, when there are times we must stand for the Lord. There are fires now in this life. There certainly is fire later. Jesus said, Matthew 10, 28, do not fear him who kills the body. Fear him who kills the body and soul in hell. Think about the fire that must be faced by those who reject Christ. I'll read these haunting words from Revelation 14. He will drink of the wine of the wrath of God, mixed in full strength in the cup of his anger, and he will be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever. They have no rest day and night. What a terrifying reality. What a faith-strengthening conviction that the God who came and rescued His servants is the God who came and endured infinite wrath in order to rescue all who would believe. So that those who believe could stand anything in this life knowing that to be safe with God is the safest place we can be. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you again for this scene, for the multiple miracles on the plain of Dura in ancient Babylon. The miracle first 
that you wrought in the hearts of young men who believed you, who believed you all the way to the end. Only you could get credit for such work in a heart. And we thank you for the miracle of rescuing them out of a fiery furnace. We thank you for the miracle of those who haven't been rescued out of the fiery furnace in the same way, but have been brought safely to their heavenly home, who have stood the test. Oh God, may we have courage like these men. We ask it in Jesus' name.